Well, with no further ado, ladies and gentlemen, welcome Pedro Lopes for our last session today, SQL Server 2016 Service Pack 1 enhancements that will make your database engine roar. You can take it away, Pedro. Goodbye. Yeah, well, hello, everyone. Um, probably some of you have seen some flavor of this um, session before, if you've attended in person in some uh, venue. Um, my name is Pedro Lopes. I'm a senior PM with the SQL Server Tiger team. We're a part of the SQL Server Engineering Group, and um, we specifically own every in-market version of SQL Server, which right now means 2012 to 2016, uh, soon to be uh, 2017. Um, another, another. So uh, let me dive right into it. We're we're talking about specifically enhancements we've done in Service Pack One, which has been out for a few months. Um, we've already. Uh, announced service pack 2 will come we don't have a specific date yet but it will it will come uh, very soon at which uh, at which point we will probably have a, a big overhaul of this session specifically but that's that's let's dive into this one so um, we one of the main changes that we've introduced in in service pack 1 stemmed from the fact that uh, we we were observing a number of uh, trends with a lot of our customers. Namely, um, it's very usual that businesses uh, grow from small, uh, maybe a couple servers, a small shop, and then grow into larger businesses, uh, which means that um, users and developers specifically need the flexibility of uh, try not tying specifically their code or the way they code their applications to a specific SKU of SQL Server that typically has to do with the uh, capabilities of the engine itself in terms of scalability, for example. So uh, it's, it, it was very use, usual that we saw customers that had their initial deployment targets uh, be standard edition to keep the cost low because they probably had a, a small ISV that works on a niche market, for example, or I'm developing for my um, medium or small company and I need to, to use standard edition to keep the cost low but then as my business grows uh, so would potentially my need to scale up SQL Server uh, but we had a number of um, features that were available only in enterprise edition so we because the initial development was done in standard edition for example or even in, in, um, in Express then that means that whatever features were used in terms of um, in terms of development um, uh, features that we could use in, in our application at the database layer were bound to standard edition. And if the business grew enough in the sense that it would require um, to scale up SQL Server capabilities and therefore migrate to Enterprise Edition, uh, we found that a lot of customers were actually reluctant to then go in and because we've changed editions, let me now modify my application to make use of these other uh, features. The example would be um, using uh, disk based tables for LTP workloads when I could instead use for 2016, for example, uh, in memory OLTP for, for, for such uh, workloads. And these were bound by addition. Um, I mentioned ISVs, that was uh, um, uh, a major target also. Uh, one, one thing we've observed is um, if, if an ISV targets uh, enterprise edition um, then it may be precluded from uh, using the same code base to in in customers that deploy lower editions of sql server so they they, they had some limitation in terms of the spectrum um, of um, customers where they could or not deploy their application to scale up or not and and obviously this this more important for isvs than 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 any other the ability to maintain a single code base is super important here. So to have a single code base that is not dependent necessarily on the engine edition that you are deploying. So we set out to remove these uh, these limitations, which uh, led to something we, it's a mouthful, that we call the common programmability surface area, which means that a number of programmability objects, if you will, uh, were, um, were unlocked for a lower SQL Server editions. Um, it's the ability to have an optimal design, which means that you, you can think and architect your application, thinking of the workload and the capabilities of the engine, 
that don't necessarily have to do with the SKU that you're deploying, and also the freedom to deploy the same application, the same code base in any uh, SQL Server Edition. So you will only, or any customer will choose SQL Server Edition that fits their requirements of performance, scalability, even high availability, but not uh, according to the features they want to put into their 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 um, programmability objects, the, the code that runs the workload on the applications themselves. So um, this is just to give a quick gist of the differences in terms of uh, feature surface area between RTM SQL Server 2016 and previous editions, obviously, uh, and, and Service Pack 1. As you can see here, uh, for the most part, uh, all these features are available across many versions of the engine. Um, you see two exceptions there because those have to do with the sorry I'm moving the camera with the architecture of the engine itself. For example, uh, for Express uh, Edition and and uh, Local DB, we don't have change data capture because that requires SQL Server agent and that's not part of the uh, Express Edition nor Local DB. Um, the same uh, the, some the the same limitation or another limitation happens within memory OLTP in local DB because that the, um, as you might know when you create an in-memory table you are you need to create that on a specific file group that is enabled for in-memory tables and that relies upon file stream technology which is not available uh, in local DB because local DB does not have enough permissions and at the OS level okay so those are kind of the two exceptions there uh, anything else as you can see on the right side of the table here we've um, unleashed or unlocked all these feature usages across several editions um, one of the you may find if you go and look at the documentation that um, that you have the choice to use all these features some of them uh, will for example the use of column store may differ in terms of performance and scal scalability between, for example, standard edition and um, enterprise, but the use of the feature is there. So if I'm maintaining a single code base, I don't need to be concerned about those topics about uh, that, that have to do with scalability because those will be directly tied to the engine uh, SKU that I'm deploying, and those will be automatically tackled by the engine, if you will. Uh, by the way, at any point, Brent, I'm not actually seeing the, the chat window, so Feel free to interrupt oh, sure. me with questions if there are any. Yeah, I can throw it. You want to see the uh, chat window? I can put it up there. Uh, well. Yes, sure. Yeah, hold on a second. I'll make you the uh, organizer too. Organizer. So now you should be able to see the uh, questions pane. Yeah, this is a previous question, right? Oh, they're all. Everything that's in there is previous. Yeah, you're good. Oh, you okay. can ignore anything that's in there so Thank far. You. you bet. <laughs> Do we have anyone in the session? Oh, yeah, like 100 and, yeah, 95. Okay, no, 95. Just, just checking. <laughs> okay. Uh, moving on. So um, I'll, I'll, I'm dividing this, sec this session mainly in two parts, the storage engine and the relational engine. I'm specifically the PM for relational engine in, in, in SQL Server uh, in market, but um, the storage engine and relational engine, so how the queries get executed and how the, the, the access methods return our data are very intertwined. So um, I, I kind of like to talk about the whole story. So for storage engine, specifically in Service Pack 1, um, we, we kind of set out in one of the enhancements we've, we've done, we kind of set out to answer a, a question. Um, does a user have a need to, or a customer ever need to create a copy of the database? Let's say I need to troubleshoot, and this, is, this kind, of, uh, kind of becomes our bread and butter here. Uh, we do a lot of uh, troubleshooting exercises with a number of customers, as does our support. Um, and part of that actually has to do with troubleshooting query performance, uh, as you do, Brent, and other folks on the call. So the ability to actually um, look at an, uh, um, uh, a query plan uh, with actual runtime stats is super important. Um, if, it, if you can't look at with runtime stats, at least understanding um, how, the how the optimizer dealt with a specific plan and how the, the, that specific plan came to be is, is important, then that stems from a number of metadata that exists around the engine, which I'll talk about uh, later on in this session. So my, my point being that uh, having that database readily available for us to, to iterate and troubleshoot, for example, is important from that perspective. Now, if we're talking about the database that has terabytes, 
or it has millions of objects, and I'm talking millions of tables, stop procedures, whatever, that becomes uh, a big, a big uh, bottleneck because we really can't take a backup of a multi-terabyte database and send over the wire to someone just because they need to restore and uh, do some query troubleshooting there. So this is a scenario that we set out to, to resolve. Another one has to do simply with testing. The ability to um, get the database schema, deploy on my test server, for example, populate with dummy data, uh, but I still keep uh, exactly the same schema. I'm, I'm, I make sure, I'm making sure I have the same schema on which I can run functional and performance tests also becomes important uh, um, at certain points of the lifetime of the application. So we set out to, to, to do something about this. And we introduced the, the command dbcc clone database. Now, this was built to be fast, as minimally invasive as possible, and pro pro provide a consistent uh, schema-only copy of the database. So we introduced it first back in SQL um, 2014 SP2. It wasn't in 2016 RTM, and that was only introduced in, uh, in 2016 SP1. Um, we also enhanced it. Uh, in 2016 SP1 to support a number of objects that were not um, available when we released uh, the same command, uh, the VC clone database, in, uh, in, in the previous version. Uh, support to bring in CLR objects, file stream, in-memory table, obviously, and um, this becomes very important when you're talking about 2016 and above, the ability to bring in uh, the query store, if, you, if you're using query store in your specific database, you can bring in query store with a schema only copy of the database. And again, because query store is like a flight recorder for your workload, it becomes very relevant when you're doing a performance troubleshooting, specifically query performance troubleshooting. So um, these were the enhancements made to, um, to uh, clone database in uh, 2016 SP1. Now, uh, I do call out for that KB, you can see on our screen now. We don't support, um, when I, let me try to clarify what I mean by not supported as production database. The way DBC clone database works is when it's a very simple syntax I'm going to show you in the next slide, but when you run it, you actually generate another database uh, in, your, in your server, which is the clone of the previous one, but just with the metadata. And then you can back it up and send it to someone or restore it in your test server, whatever you want to do with it. The point being that at this point in time, uh, because we still don't have a 100% reliable copy of all metadata objects from the source to this clone, for example, we are missing um, statistics over column store indexes. We have a published script uh, as a workaround to as you generate the, the clone, then you can still add the um, statistics from um, uh, column store from the source to your clone. But again, this is a, a workaround. So we are still working um, to the point where we will have 100% um, coverage of all the potential objects that may exist in a database between the source and its clone. So that's one of the reasons we don't support it as a production database, because let's say you um, clone a database and there is some uh, type of object uh, that we don't clone. And if you're relying on your uh, clone database to then run some part of your business, well, um, that, uh, that may, may yield r strange results or uh, unwarranted behaviors. So that's why we don't support this in production as of yet. Um, just to give you a few numbers here, because numbers are obviously important, we want to understand a hey, why have you um, uh, released this command when you had other ways of cloning a database. Um, let's look here, and I'm going to I'm going to actually talk more about the, the last you, the last example you see on the table there. A uh, very large uh, ERP database, a uh, very well known uh, ISV that that uh, makes up the software, uh, and we. We were uh, attempting to clone a database or to get a schema-only copy of a database that had over one million objects. Now, when you have the option of scripting out a database with data, uh, um, sorry, with the metadata in SSMS, do, do keep in mind that SSMS is a 32-bit application, therefore it is limited in, uh, in, um, in the memory it can, it can use, so we 
not long after we got an out-of-memory error from SSMS and SSMS crashed. It was just a very large database with too many uh, scripts, too many, sorry, too many objects to script out and we ran it into out-of-memory. Now, um, we also have another method of cloning a database to create a schema-only copy of a database that has been out there for some time and that, that we've previously used um, to actually uh, generate these schema-only uh, copies of the database if a customer came to us with a performance issue and we needed to run the same type of exercise I mentioned earlier. But as you can see here, it took uh, quite a few minutes to run uh, SP clone database in, um, in uh, a database that had over one million objects. So it was still a hurdle because you had to wait a long time before you were able to get the, the uh, schema-only copy of the database. Now, with DBCC clone database, because this works at the access method layer, it's not working in SMO or any high-level over-the-engine kind of artifact, we we're able to do this kind of operation much faster. And for the same database, uh, multi-terabyte, over one million objects, we were able to do it just over two minutes, which is a 60 times improvement over the method of cloning with SP clone database. So um, what I mean by this is it now becomes easier, uh, and again, I'm, I'm referring back to the troubleshooting uh, aspect of it, although uh, testing uh, purposes also works. But when you need to troubleshoot, uh, you need, and if you, if you actually need the metadata from your um, source database with all the tables, statistics, indexes, and whatnot, you need to generate this fast and without, uh, with minimally uh, intrusion, if you will, uh, in terms of resource usage in your source system. So we, by doing it at the access method level, we are able to get extreme performance for generating this very large, um, very large uh, database clone. I mean, let me rephrase that. The clone is very small, actually, just a few megabytes. But we're able to iterate through a ginormous database with more than a million objects, as you can see here, very, very quickly. OK, so let me uh, move on from here. Uh, I, I, I said I would uh, show you a few um, test cases or a uh, few ways you can use clone database. Uh, the syntax is very simple, as you can see here. A DBCC clone database, give me a source name, a, a target name, and that's it. I will see a new database created in my system, which will be tagged as clone, um, and it will be read-only, by the way, and, um, and that's it. So I will generate uh, with all the statistics, with query store metadata, and, and I'm done. But, for example, if I want a schema and query store only clone, I have a few options I can do here. For example, um, as you may know, statistics in the histograms do have the potential of having um, um, data because, let's say, I'm uh, creating an index over a table that has a, a first name column. Um, in the histogram, I will see a few names of people that uh, are in that uh, table, in that column, um, that make up the, um, the several buckets in my histogram that, that allow me to, all allows the engine to check the um, selectivity and a number of other things based on that. Well, if, uh, if you are, if you need to provide a clone of the database, let's say for uh, whatever purpose, uh, but you have some um, uh, limitations in the kind of data you can, you are allowing to, to uh, give to someone else, you may not want to, to include statistics in that clone. Uh, this is more like for functional tests, for example, because if you if you would do performance troubleshooting, you would need the statistics. But if I'm doing performance functional tests and I need to copy the database, then uh, this is enough. I don't need the statistics there. So I can create the clone with that with no statistics keyword. Or, for example, um, if I need to run actually performance uh, testing, uh, which means that I would need the, the statistics there to kind of uh, simulate the, the quality of the plans in my source um, system, but I don't want query store because I'm generating a new set of performance test cases. So I could do without query store, as you can see in blue in the screen there. Or if I actually don't want statistics nor query store, let's say I just want to uh, generate the schema-only copy of the database, uh, and my purpose there is to um, uh, populate with dummy data so that I can run some kind of uh, tests uh, that have nothing to do with how the data looks like in the source system. Well, then you can do without statistics and without query store and still generate that clone very, very easily. These are just of some of the uh, uh, improvements here. 
Um, in terms of supportability improvements that we've also added um, to, to Service Pack 1, for example, in the CZMOS Info, um, we are now uh, allowing a very easy way for DBAs to understand if log pages in memory uh, privilege has been given to a SQL Server account or not. Um, the use, this is to be very, uh, very often uh, um, uh, uh, kind of uh, privilege that you would give to the SQL Server account um, back, in, for example, in Windows Server 2003 and even 2008, because of the way the Windows Memory Manager worked, uh, we could have the potential of uh, paging out much easy, uh, easier than we do nowadays in Windows Server 2012 and above. Uh, still, if you want to make sure that the OS uh, cannot page out part of your SQL Server process, which if you're running low on memory, that may be a very good idea. Um, you can see if the, the SQL Server account already has that privilege or not. And if it doesn't, you can act accordingly. Uh, so it becomes as simple as running a query over CZMOS info, and you'll get an indication of which memory uh, model you are using right there. Uh, before then, you would have to run some WMI query or, um, or use some uh, UI tool to be able to understand that, or PowerShell. Uh, another one is the ability to understand if the SQL Server service account has the proper permission to use the instant file initialization feature. This, uh, become, this is very common to use uh, out there in the wild. It is, um, it is an, uh, in effect, an efficiency we can take advantage of, an efficiency that's part of Windows OS that SQL Server can take advantage of when it's, for example, uh, growing um, files. Uh, data files specifically. So again, you would need to use some kind of UI or PowerShell or WMI query to understand if this was available, which meant for a DBA going outside the scope of SSMS or the tools that a DBA usually uses. More so if you are in an organization that has a very strict separation of duties between a DBA and a sysadmin, in which case you probably wouldn't be able to even to even go into the OS and, and um, look at the permissions of the SQL Server account to understand if those two permissions that you really, uh, that any DBA will want to understand the, their status uh, would be able to, to understand. So um, by adding a, this data to the CZM Server Services DMV, we're now able to see, as you can see on the screenshot right here, that inst instant file initialization has not been enabled in this case for this um, default server here. So if you are using this as part of any uh, script that collects information over an instance, again, this also becomes a data point that's relevant to consume. Um, for this next one, well, I'm purposely uh, leaving those, uh, those fonts very, very small. It's not to, for you to read the information there, but rather for us to just uh, just uh, show to you another way that we actually we, we always listen to customers and frustrations and pains when we are thinking about what to improve next in the engine for in-market versions, which then obviously for the very nature of, of versioning also gets to higher versions of SQL. So in this case, um, if you were using in-memory OLTP in uh, SQL Server 2016 RTM or any, any update after that but before Service Pack 1, uh, more often than not, you would see uh, your error log uh, kind of uh, polluted, if you will, with a number of uh, debug messages uh, that we kind of left there. Um, but if you are making a heavy use of this uh, feature, uh, then you would, you would see that your error log would be too noisy. And maybe if, you're, if you rely on the, on the error log to look in relevant informations, you would kind of be uh, distracted by that. So in Service Pack 1, you just made sure that uh, those noisy messages are turned off by default. So as you can see in the bottom of the screen there, uh, for the same, um, for the same uh, operations running on uh, OLTP, in-memory OLTP, if you will, you see much less information from them. Okay. So uh, more supportability improvements that we've added to the storage engine had to do with uh, understanding the status quo of your TempDB. So now, uh, starting with SP1, you will see uh, the error log message uh, regarding TempTB to have more information uh, there. Uh, you can see here the number of TempTB files. You can see here if uh, any of the TempTB data files have as a different size or a different auto growth setting. 
from other files uh, in, in TempDB and and this um, this uh, boils down to the fact that in TempDB more even than any other database uh, you will want to have the same uh, all the same all the data files growing at uh, if, if they need to grow obviously uh, I would expect you to manage it manually but if they need to grow grow uh, at the specific uh, auto growth setting that is the same across all um, files but also that the size of those files remains the same uh, because that's the way you can use more efficiently the proportional fill algorithm so those matches ma messages became part of error log so um, uh, a few other uh, performance enhancements have to do with um, migrating large uh, data sets and um, this this is a statement for for from the there's a post in the SAP on SQL Server no SQL Server on SAP blog um, the, an enhancement that we've done to make migrations of large data sets very much faster uh, as it relates to previous versions so specifically working with SAP um, we were able to reduce uh, migration time by about 60 percent as you can see here uh, when they were moving data from between heaps. And how did you do this? Well, the bulk, bulk insert specifically um, will will be able to use auto tab lock using the a new the Trace Flex 715, uh, and this was introduced back in previous versions, as you can see in the screen there. Uh, enabling <coughs> this trace flag allows the performance of bulk insert to be um, to be much higher than it was before, and we do have some comparisons here. Um, as you can see on the screen, um, if you didn't, this is a database, uh, SAP database, uh, using um, transparent data encryption, uh, which is used by default nowadays. And you can see the difference between uh, not using the trace flag or using the trace flag both in, let me get my mouse here, uh, both in terms of um, time to run the operation and in terms of throughput per second. So as you can see here, by enabling TraceFlex 715 and using Auto Tab Lock, um, we're able to kind of turbo boost, if you will, the throughput of rows flowing between heaps uh, in in the scenario of SAP migration. So this is uh, probably something you can use in your own data migrations if that this is the, you have the same kind of scenario that SAP uses by moving data with bulk insert here. Okay, um, this is. Uh, this is not so much an enhancement, this is more of a change. Here's the thing, back in SQL 2016 RTM, the behavior for inserting to select from something was different between user tables and local temp tables. Uh, essentially, yes, this was a bug uh, that was there by default. So in essence, if you were running the kind of inserting to select from operation on user tables, um, a parallel insert would require a tab lock hint. To be able to run uh, to do the, those parallel inserts, but if you were doing this kind of operations by insert, inserting into a, a local temp table, then the parallel insert was there by default, uh, whether you used or not the tab lock hint. Now this was um, an uh, inconsistency of behavior between uh, when using insert into select from. Uh, depending on the type of underlying object, right? So we've kind of uh, resolved that in 2016 SP1. So to be able to use, uh, to be able to run parallel inserts in that kind of operation, inserting to select from, you will need to uh, hint the query with tab lock. But if you do so, you will see that uh, you'll be able to, will be able to do parallel inserts here. And in that sense, if you are ingesting large data sets that you, and you can take the, the tab lock hint, you will see that the runtime for that I I data ingestion will be much uh, smaller. And uh, and this is just uh, because uh, you if you if you want administratively to just turn off or disable parallelism during inserts, whether you're using tab lock hint in some query or not, well, uh, that uh, DBA still has the privilege, obviously, of uh, turning on this um, trace flag and disabling parallelism and insert. By the way, this trace flag and a number of others uh, we've been adding even as recently as this week, we've documented yet another trace flag in, in the trace flag page in, in Books Online, just um, 
to make sure those uh, are as much as possible the uh, reference um, in terms of what trace flags exist in SQL Server. Uh, okay, and we have we do have a KB uh, on that. So let me just give you a quick peek on what am I doing on time? Oh, just oh you're fine. I still have to speed up. Um, well, remember, well, remember you got like up to ninety minutes here if you want it. So I can. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll yeah. Probably take close to that. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I was imagining sixty. I don't know why. Yeah, anyway. I know everybody thinks so. Uh, yeah, yeah. So let me give you a, a quick peek on uh, what's coming next for storage engine. Um, next uh, means not only SQL Server 2017, but also uh, when um, when applicable, uh, a future service pack for, in this case, for SQL Server 2016, for example. So um, I'm, uh, we've, we're trying to make sure that uh, backups become smarter. And whether you're using your own flavor of script or you're using actually OLA solution or you're using some um, a vendor application to manage your backups, as long as they support this kind of operation, um, you, you'll be able to manage your backups uh, in a smarter way. What do I mean by this? So look on this slide and what I have here is a, a, a week, a work week. And my backup strategy, which actually should be a restore strategy, but let's not even go there. Uh, but the way I'm doing backups, let me rephrase like that, is um, I have my differential backup starting on Monday. And let's say 10% of my database uh, change. So uh, my first uh, differential backup. And I'm assuming here that I'm taking my full backups on Sunday, obviously. So I'm taking differential backups every day of the week. But it comes to a point, in this case on Wednesday already, uh, I'm, I already have most of my database changed and still I continue to do differential backups uh, throughout the rest of the week, which will basically be uh, full backups. The caveat being that uh, when you actually need to restore, your uh, restore chain is now too long and it will impact your recovery time of Objective. Why? Well, because you obviously need to restore first the full backup, which was taken on Sunday, and then you need to jump into the last differential backup, which now is exactly the same size as your, as your full database backup, or even bigger, because uh, if the database actually grew, and any transaction log backups you have after that one. So uh, by uh, a, a, a better um, a better way of managing this would be. Uh, on Wednesday, I should already be doing another full backup because I'm already uh, changing too much of the database to justify uh, continuing with differential backups. And let's say I would have done my full backup here on a Wednesday. That meant that on Thursday, I would probably be back at 10%. At Friday, also probably back at 85%, at 40%, sorry. And on Saturday, again, another full backup. If I had a disaster after this, for example, uh, based on the last full backup that I would have taken on Wednesday, I would restore that. A 40% size of the original backup uh, restore here, and then any transaction log backup. So just just making it smaller, and and it, I would have a, a shorter RTO. Now we are attempting to make uh, differential backups uh, sm smarter because we're now reporting in the DMV CDMDB file space usage how many extents were modified uh, since the last full backup. So a backup solution that starts to take this into account will be able to make a call at any given point in time if too many, and too many would be your own flavor, obviously, we're just providing the data. Uh, but let's say my rule of thumb would be if 50% uh, of the database changes, uh, then I don't do a, a, a differential, but rather do a full backup. Well, at this point in time, uh, by resorting to the data that I'm, that I'm being that's uh, made available here, uh, my backup solution will be able to understand, okay, from the full number of extents in the database, I've already changed 50 whatever percent. It's time now to do, instead of the full backup, I would, the, the, sorry, the differential backup I would be doing, now I'm switching to full backup. So it just makes this smarter. In, full, in all essence, what this means is I'm, I've taken my full backup on Sunday, I've done my 10% changes on Monday, so differential backup. Another differential backup on Tuesday because I've changed 40% of my database. But now on Wednesday, because I've already changed 85%, I'm now doing a full backup instead of a differential backup. 
uh, which means that then by Thursday, I probably only have 10% changes again. If this was obviously a uh, very, uh, very predictable uh, data changes in my database, I would have 40% again on Friday, which would mean that on Saturday, I would have in, uh, also possibly doing a differential backup. And with this ability, I'm now being smarter on when to take my backups, what type of backups, now keeping my recovery time objective in mind rather than the size of the backups themselves or the cadence of the, uh, the, the in which I do uh, database backups. So I would have not only faster restores, but I would be saving on storage because if you look above, you will see a number of days where I'm actually taking differential backups that are 100% of the, the database size Whereas by using this ability and making sure my script solution, backup solutions are more adaptable, you'll be able to uh, also have some storage savings here. Okay, um, that, has, that had to do with full database backups. Now we've also done some, some enhancements to allow a smarter transaction log backup. Now you see here a timeline, and um, in this specific timeline, as my, uh, as my uh, workload progresses and as I get more, um, more log records into my transaction log, um, you would see, let me get my mouse again, these lines uh, kind of represent a size of a database or a, of a transaction log backup. So you see the size, uh, I'm, I'm taking backups every 15 minutes, right? Uh, and this is actually wrong, this would be longer. Anyway, uh, I'm taking at 15 minute intervals, but obviously depending on the workload that's been running in the previous 15 minutes, I will have different sizes of my transaction log backup, right? Uh, and if I don't back up in time, if you will, or I, uh, for my uh, log to be able, if nothing else stands in the way, to be able to, um, to uh, circulate, to, to circle through, uh, then I will have some autogrows kicking in here which will obviously also delay my, my workload itself. So this becomes unpredictable because I can't really predict the transaction log activity. I'll have a different sizes of database, uh, of sorry, of transaction log backups. Uh, I will have potentially have auto grows kicking in. So it's not a good place to be at. So uh, we've introduced a new column in, uh, in the DMF CZMDB log stats. Um, in which you are able to understand how much log has been accumulated for that database since the last log backup. So now, for example, you, you can be smarter about your log backups, and in the same timeline, now I'm able to um, do my log backups based on the amount of log and not on some, ra some specific uh, intervals that on which I have absolute unpredictability of the size of the resulting log backup. So now I'm able to say, for example, let's say these uh, lines represented 100 megabytes. I am able to, to uh, set off uh, whatever script or backup solution that's, that I'm using. If they make use of this new information, they can now just trigger a transaction log backup at the time that I've, uh, at a time that already accumulated the amount of log that I've preset as my required transaction log. So that means that I have consistent transaction log, uh, transaction log backup size. I can, um, I can delay autogrows in the sense that um, I can now uh, see at what transaction log uh, uh, rate I'm at. Uh, I know the full size of my transaction log, and therefore I'm able to, uh, again, if nothing else stands in the way, obviously we have a number of caveats here that may prevent uh, log truncation, but if nothing else prevents log truncation, you are able to uh, kick off your backups uh, just before your transaction log would have to grow, okay? And that makes it more consistent, but, uh, but also more predictable for that, uh, on that perspective. I'm actually going to skip this demo in uh, in the interest of uh, of time. But again, uh, like I did last time, I'll put all my demos in our GitHub, so you'll be able to go there and and, and take advantage of those. Okay. Uh, another one that's uh, coming in is the ability to do selecting to on a specific file group. So as you can see um, in the syntax on the screen here, I'm able to. Um, uh, th this would be your your current way of doing selecting to. 
uh, you can uh, create this database and then I would select into that specific table from a specific source and that's it now um, we are a adding this um, syntax that uh, that allows you to specify on which file group you want that selecting to 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 um, kind of drop the rows that you're moving over so it becomes easier to manage if you are if you actually re require um, different um, if you're managing a larger database that has multiple file groups and you you are able to do some read workload in, in parts of the database and in others specifically um, uh, do selecting tools of large data sets uh, something else we've done is to improve at setup time uh, the TempDB configuration um, configuration uh, aspect so uh, we've again we've heard the community uh, this was a change so the overall change you see here was done in, in 2016 RPM uh, it had different limits for a number of options you see here uh, and we've listened to the community and we've changed those so now the um, the max DB uh, the max file size for uh, TempDB has been increased to 256 gigabytes um, we've also um, so yeah keep aware that larger values will increase setup time uh, because at this point in time we still don't have instant file initialization turned on um, and we will uh, e warn you if uh, instant file initialization is not enabled if you had set an initial size over one gigabyte so if you had done so if you haven't if you hadn't turned instant file initialization on you can still go back uh, in the in the wizard uh, there is an option now in setup since 2016 RTM to, to enable uh, the permission uh, that allows SQL Server to use instant file initialization and therefore at this point in setup um, you, you would be growing your files the way you want to and set up the initial size as you want to uh, without being necessarily um, uh, running through setup a long time because if those files need to be uh, zeroed out it could take some, some time here. Um, yeah, and we also will uh, warn you if the log size you've set for TempDB is over one gigabyte, and that's obviously irrespective of instant file initialization because the log files cannot use that. Okay. Uh, yet again, it's still in the, in the storage engine. Some uh, changes we've done to, or we will introduce. Uh, this is not in Service Pack One, by the way. Obviously, this is future changes, and you can already take advantage of those in 2017. Um, is for example the understanding how your version store is being used within TempDB. So we've, we're introducing a new DMV, the CDM trend version store space usage. It's quite a mouthful, but in essence, it will allow you to see how much um, how much each database, or in the context of each database, how much of the version store in TempDB is being used. Um, it has it has a lot more performance than uh, understanding the the comparable, if you will, uh, way of understanding which uh, in this case session was using uh, version store, and that's using uh, CDMDB session space usage. Um, with this new DMV, you you have uh, not only better performance in retrieving that data, but you do it per database, which means that you are now able to very quickly pinpoint. Uh, which database for example is using not only is using version store but even maybe that's using more of the version store and maybe that is a warranted behavior but it, maybe that is not but you have that insight there where it wasn't there before um, also on um, transaction log monitoring and diagnostics maybe you've used before the BCC log info uh, as a DBCC command it's something that it's not necessarily a programmability object that you can use in line and derive some some uh, some insights from there programmatically uh, and it's also a command that uh, has some intrusion in terms of the uh, the uh, access methods so we've released this new DMF um, the CCMDB log info uh, DMF because you need a parameter of the database info but it will give you a lot of the information you would uh, dump DBCC log info to obtain. Um, you will get, for example, um, the VLF information. This is one of the main uh, um, outputs that you may 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 be using nowadays. DBCC log info is to understand how many VLFs my uh, transaction log has, how many of those are active, how many of those are inactive, and even the size of those. 
um, you would uh, you can also see information about checkpoint uh, recovery information so a lot of information that that is available in the PCC log info now is available in a cleaner way in the in in this DMF field um, in terms of um, some uh, some uh, backup improvements that we've done uh, this has to do with the fact that uh, as you may uh, see from from the screen here as uh, the, the current behavior or if you if you are in 2016 RTM uh, uh, or in 2016 sorry, spec one or previous versions you may notice this behavior whereas uh, as your database size grows the time it takes to do a full uh, a backup also increases um, and uh, for example you see exponentially increasing actually for when when you start really getting into the multi gigabyte uh, area in terms of, of storage usage and uh, that compared to SQL Server 2017 uh, it takes less time to do so why is that well if you think when you do a database backup, um, something you need to do is to, for example, scrub the the um, all the memory and to understand which pages in the buffer pool are dirty or not. So you need to also take them with the backup, obviously. Now um, we've enhanced the way we do that scrubbing of uh, buffer pool so that it is faster, which means that when you have a very large buffer pool. Even uh, let's say you have a, you have a buffer pool that takes one terabyte, but you have only very small databases in your in your system. Now we would still need to, for the most part, scrub the entire buffer pool to look at the pages that belong to that very small database. For example, let's look at the example of a one gigabyte database that had let's say just one table inside that had almost one gigabyte. That meant that if I had changed all the pages there. I would need to. Uh, I would need almost two minutes to uh, scrub the 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 memory space to retrieve information about uh, dirty pages to be able to then do the backup here. Um, that goes down to four seconds under SQL Server 2017, for example. So um, th this way, uh, um, maybe some some um, some issue that you've. Uh, gone through in your own production server that is kind of similar to this which is I have a very large buffer pool very large server in terms of uh, memory capabilities I don't have very large databases why would a one gig database take two minutes to backup that should be almost instantaneous right um, and yet this was uh, the 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 outcome that we were seeing that stems from a number of things but namely um, if you think that only in the recent years have servers grown in terms of cap in, in terms of hardware, and uh, all this uh, method was architected back when we had a few gigabytes of memory, right? Uh, so nowadays, uh, as you can see, as your database grows, um, obviously the time to backup also grows, but it's significantly less uh, than uh, previous versions. So previous to SQL Server 2017, and also. In small databases, that's where you actually see the most gain in this scenario. So this is something we've done here. <coughs> Sorry. And just to finish the part of uh, uh, storage engine, um, improvements we've done was to add more information to CCDM OS info. For example, it, it, it became kind of cumbersome to understand really how many cores did you do you have on your SQL server by doing uh, uh, T-SQL queries to some um, uh, uh, runtime system object. Uh, we had the hyperthread ratio, which is not really a very uh, trustworthy way of understanding how many cores you have in the underlying uh, um, uh, bare metal. So uh, we're exposing these three new columns, so it becomes much easier and 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 uh, transparent to understand how many sockets I have, how many cores per socket I have in my server, and therefore um, if it, the, this information for DBAs is very important. And, becomes apparent right there. Um, for the clone database for 2017, we're also doing a, a couple of uh, enhancements, support for full text indexes, for example. Um, and one other topic here, um, it's, uh, so when you, when you create a clone database, for example, in 2016 SP1, um, if you have a query store running in a specific database, we will actually flush all the runtime statistics that are still in memory 
to query store before generating the, the clone DB. Um, this is this is some sorry, this is something that will happen but does not happen right now. So what happens is right now if on 16 SP1 you take a clone database, you may see that some data may be missing from query store. That all depends on the um, on uh, the setting you've set to flush information from memory to query store uh, storage. Uh, but we made sure that in 2017, we will actually, if you're taking a backup uh, clone right now, we'll flush memory data to storage before actually generating the, um, the clone here. Okay, so uh, moving on to relational engine, which is my, actually, my favorite area of SQL Server. Um, we, we also set out to uh, fix a few, or to address, let's call it like that because of those aren't exactly fixes, but to address a number of uh, inefficiencies that you had uh, when you were trying to diagnose performance of query plans. So up until SQL Server 2016, we had um, a number of re very relevant information already in show plans, so in the, in, in the execution plan that you can retrieve from cache or at runtime. We already exposed the max memory that was enabled for the query, be that in terms of the grant, be that in terms of the memory for, for optimization. Um, we also had information about the trace flags that were enabled. This is something we've introduced in 2016 and also in, in, uh, uh, in the previous service pack for 2014. Um, we also had a, a memory grant warning uh, that I've talked about in, in previous uh, occasions, uh, but we, were, we are still missing a number of other relevant information that we can uh, use to essentially make show plan almost a one-stop shop for anything performance, query performance related. So what we've done is to add some more information here. Uh, we've added information about the parameters data type. Um, that may be kind of uh, um, redundant, if you will, if you're looking at a plan from a store procedure, for example, uh, where not only do you do you do you see the if you have implicit conversion issues, for example, you'll see in the con in the implicit conversion warning what data type you're converting to, and if it's a store procedure or something that you have access to seeing the um, incoming parameters, you'll see the source data type. So that would kind of be. Uh, redundant to use this information. But for example, if you're in a case where you're using prepared SQL, where you, we're only gathering the plan from a execution handle, you don't really have that data. So understanding it, when I'm looking at a, a implicit conversion warning that may affect the ability of the optimizer to, um, to do his job properly, uh, I can now see exactly, okay, I know which data type this was converted to, and now I know in line which uh, data type um, the, the, the incoming parameter uh, was. So I can understand if I can do something either in my code base or even at the table uh, level. I also now have CPU and execution elapsed time for the entire query. This is located at the root node of your plan. Um, kind of makes redundant using set statistics IO and set statistics time. Uh, if you collect the actual execution plan, your actual CPU elapsed time and execution elapsed time will already be there in show plan. Um, we've also introduced, uh, and that's based on the CDM exact session wait stats uh, DMV, we've now, we're now capturing um, the top 10, up to the top 10 weights that a specific execution can wait on. Um, I know there are a couple of connect items that have to do with um, with a couple of uh, weight types that are not included in this, in the in show plan, or may not be included in show plan, uh, we are working our way through those. Uh, just in case you are wondering, uh, and those will be will be dealt with uh, very very soon. So uh, here's the kind of information uh, you had up until SQL Server 2016, in terms of understanding, if you were looking at a plan, understanding per operator. Uh, what is the what are the performance metrics you could gather uh, for each operator? For example, thinking of a scan, an index scan. So you see here three rows are highlighted um, or are boldened. This these are the three data points you could get up until SQL Server 2016 uh, RTM uh, for a scan. 
you would able to see how many actual rows were output by the scan. You would able to see the number of executions. Uh, and you'd be able to see uh, the actual end of scans, but that's it. So not really a lot of actionable information uh, when you were doing query troubleshooting. And that's probably why you were collecting set statistics IO um, to be able to see more uh, specifically the number, the, the, the IO characteristics of this scan. So what we've done in 2016 RTM and 2014 SP2 was to extend the, the data points we have for each operator under uh, the runtime counters per thread. So everything that you see here uh, is available in these versions when you collect an actual plan. So for the scope of the same scan, for example, I would be able to see, uh, or let's, let's actually use another example. I'm looking at an index seek operator that is actually a range scan. Now, um, I, would able, I would be able to see, for example, not only the actual rows that were output by this operation, but also the actual rows that were read by this operation. That may differ, and I have a quick example of, of, of that uh, in the next uh, couple slides. Um, I would be able to, for example, see how much CPU or elapsed time that scan took. So I would also be able to look at the logical reads, physical reads, read aheads, a number of relevant information for the scope of analyzing the performance of a specific scan in this case. This is for uh, a number of data read operators that we have this, this information available. And uh, in uh, SQL 2016 SP1, we've actually added three new uh, properties for the runtime counters per thread. Um, these uh, apply to uh, hash matches and sorts. Um, whereas we are also outputting the memory grant information for these two types of operators. So again, um, hash matches and uh, sorts. Uh, do mind this, um, this note here, depending on whether, so these runtime counters per thread and this, um, the, the cost of the operators runs up to three, but it only runs up to three if we are looking at row mode operators. If you're looking at batch mode operators, then it is the up the tree, you will not see the values from uh, the child. So just to keep that in mind in case you're analyzing a plan that has both row mode operators and batch mode operators specifically. So and how are we actually exposing these? Uh, these are in the show plan XML, obviously, but you can see them in SSMS just by, uh, in this case, as you can see here for this index scan, just by uh, looking at these uh, properties of the, that cluster index scan. I'm able to see here uh, all the IO characteristics, so the logical reads, the reader has, the physical reads. So that means that I don't need statistics IO anymore. I don't need to ask anyone to, hey, when you run this query to collect the actual plan, please keep in mind that you need to, to set statistics IO beforehand and then collect the plan. Um, I also have information about the actual number of rows, and in this case, per thread, if I'm running a multi-threaded operation. And uh, what I can see from here, for example, and this will already be a, an insight you may derive from looking at this data, will be, for example, that obviously the output, the actual number of rows was 121,000, but you see some imbalance between these threads. Now, that, that is, uh, for the most part, natural in the sense that most tables will not have a perfect data distribution, and therefore, um, between uh, the SQL Server optimizer estimating the uh, amount of rows that each, each thread would be doing versus what they actually do has very much to do with how accurate your statistics are as they relate to the underlying data distribution. If they are not that accurate, then you can have this kind of imbalance. So what I'm seeing in all essence is, if I see this kind of example, one thing I would want to look at after the fact would be how, how accurate are my statistics. Are they being updated with, uh, proper, with a proper sample size? Um, are they being, am I updating with a manual sample size, but then overriding uh, that with auto-update stats, which, by the way, it's something we're also addressing um, in, in the new future. Uh, so I can already derive that, that kind of uh, insight about parallelism imbalance, if you will, when I look at this. Uh, but then, like I said, we also have the actual time statistics, and this, this is per operator also, which means I no longer need set statistics time anymore. 
Okay, and we have the corresponding X event that has all this information in. I just move forward. Um, another another topic that is important here is, um, and this is something that uh, Rob Farley is quite keen on. Uh, so a shout out here for him because he helped us identify what we could do to make this uh, easier to troubleshoot. Um, we it, it's about detect how to detect if our underlying index design is efficient enough for the predicates that we're using. In all essence, are we using our predicates to search in our uh, indexes efficiently or not? So if you if you think about the concept of what actual number of rows means, this is, if you look at the output of any operator, like the index scan that we had a minute ago, the actual number of rows are whatever rows are output by that operator. That does not mean that it's the number of rows that that operator actually touched on, that that operator actually scanned in the, in the case of a scan. So we are only seeing the number of rows that are returned after any predicate, if any, is applied to that uh, operator. Um, and typically, this means that we're able to push that predicate down to the storage engine rather than filtering after the fact. Um, we, this is a scenario that's usually hidden from the actual execution plan, or was, should I say. Because, for example, it, would be, it could be common for you to find a plan where you would see a seek operator that was returning 10 rows, but it was taking a long time to execute. And maybe you were collecting the set statistics IO, and you were seeing that the C Hello? Oh. Yeah, I lost you there for a second. There you oh, go. Wow. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Did you lose the internet there for a second? Or? I don't know. Uh, this just said uh, we lost your audio. Did you lose my screen also? <laughs> no, the screen's still good. So you were in the middle of the last okay. thing you said was, yeah, yeah. You can okay. take, a, take a drink now or whatever if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Moments of excitement good there. On. I thought it was my internet, of course. I'm like, oh, did I? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Maybe I touched the okay. So as I was saying, um, a scenario where you're seeing a, a, a seek returning 10 rows but taking a long time, or maybe you're even seeing a lot of CPU being used, but the query plan didn't really reflect that. You only saw a seek with 10 rows coming out of it. What gives? So now what? What can you do to actually troubleshoot this kind of scenario? And this is what we set out to improve, the ability to troubleshoot these sort of scenarios. So. Think about this query here uh, over AdventureWorks, so it's easy enough. And let's keep these two key stats in our mind. Um, we have the actual number of rows in the result set is 39. But the actual rows read by the underlying, uh, in the underlying table was over 100,000. So this is being done by clustered index scan. So keeping those key stats in mind, let's look at the type of information I would have, let's say, for example, in SQL Server 2014, uh, pre-SP2 for this scan. I would know that this scan uh, returned 39 rows and it estimated 1,500. That's it. I have no more information here. So uh, I, if I was kind of in the, um, in the scenario I just mentioned, um, I, was, I was seeing a plan that had very few rows coming out of this scan, but uh, I knew it was taking a long time, and I couldn't really connect one piece of information to the other. Maybe looking at set statistics IO, I was able to see a lot of IO there, but not really giving me much more than, yeah, there's a large disconnect between the number of rows I'm outputting here and actually the something that's, being, that's happening at the storage engine level. Well, in SQL Server 2016, RTM, uh, we've introduced a new uh, property there, which is the number of rows read. So I, here, in both cases, I'm still looking at the actual execution plan, obviously. But now I'm able to see, OK, uh, I've estimated 1,500 rows. Uh, I've retrieved, so I've output 39 rows. But in, all, in essence, this scan actually read through over 100,000 rows. So I now have more actionable information that allows me, or more, I have a better understanding of why this scan that only output 39 rows actually took as long as it did. It was actually reading much more. 
but this already gave me the gave me the ability to uh, when I'm looking at an actual execution plan see uh, this difference and so create an hypothesis over uh, the ability that SQL Server is having or not to properly push down my predicate meaning what do I mean by this so my predicate whatever the predicate is in this query so uh, these two clauses here makes up 39 rows in my transaction history table now whatever index I'm using in this case I'm doing a cluster index scan to filter out even at the storage engine level by the way this is being pushed down because I only have a cluster index scan I don't have a, a filter after the fact but I'm still reading a lot just to uh, uh, address the predicate I have so this is not very efficient a more efficient use would be I would have if not the same, a very close number between the actual number of rows and the number of rows read. That meant that not only do I have the best possible index for these predicates here, but also says that the, uh, the execution engine was able to push down the predicate to the storage engine, in which case I only read the number of rows that were needed for my output. Instead of this imbalance you see on the screen here, where I read many more rows that that those were that were needed for my actual output and many times this kind of um, skew already exists at the at compile time which means that I should be able to somewhat detect if I'm prone to this situation at compile time but alas in in 2016 I only had uh, runtime information so in 2016 SP1 we've added this extra property estimated number of rows to be read uh, this tells me um, at compile time which then means that I can for example scrub my cache plans and kind of do some exercise of understanding do I have plans there that have a large skew between estimated rows and estimated number of rows to be read because those will potentially be queries that I can without going into runtime already take to the side and try to tune them or the query on the underlying index design in order to uh, close this gap so we've added this uh, this extra information here these two are available in the uh, cached plan which means that now I can programmatically scrub my cache and do some exercise there okay so again in the interest of time I'm skipping this one uh, all my demos are running either on databases that are created in the script or on AdventureWorks so I'll make sure all those are available again in our GitHub. Uh, Brent, if you will, once, once you post the session or whatnot, if you can just be so kind to put the link there, then everyone can run the uh, demos. And if they have yeah. any question, uh, Twitter, uh, any other means that you have to reach me, please do, and I'll be happy to address those. Perfect. OK. So uh, another pain point that we've set out to, um, to address in Service Pack 1 was the ability to affect or to influence query execution without being sysadmin. Now look at this uh, simple query here, and let's say I needed, because I ran through some tuning exercise, and for some reason I need to uh, use a trace flag at the query level. In this case, 9481. Um, if I'm a sysadmin, this runs just fine. However, if I'm not a sysadmin, <coughs> that uh, query cannot run because the trace flag bit of it cannot be run by a user that does not have sysadmin context and therefore I would not be able to run the query. Um, we have since then added a framework of new classes of hints for the optimizer uh, which are exposed through this new use hint uh, notation and specifically to use the legacy cardinality estimation instead of using a trace flag I now have plain English or almost plain English um, options or hints that tell me exactly what these are doing. Not only that, but if you go and look at the uh, books online page on query hints, all these uh, hints are uh, documented. So you can use them not only uh, in line in your query, but without requiring your, the user context on which this runs on to be a sysadmin. Uh, there are overall nine different hints supported here that were previously only available as trace flags. And they've also provided this DMV here, the CZM exec valid use hints, to make sure that uh, at any given engine version that you are on, 
you're able to check if a specific um, hint is available or not. Let's say, for example, you are developing code that will run on SQL Server, and uh, you are in the future you would be running uh, with a use hint that is not on a previous version. Uh, right now we haven't made changes to this, but let's say we introduce new hints, and in the future version you have a hint that is not on in SP1. You would be able with this DMV to programmatically uh, understand if uh, whatever hints I'm using are available in the previous version of the engine or not before I generate the SQL that will run with that use hint. So it's just a programmatic way for, for example, ISVs or someone that maintains a code base that can be used across SQL Server versions as users apply community of updates and service packs to then be, um, to then be, uh, can make that call programmatically. And I lost audio then for a second. Okay. So these are the, um, the use hints that exist. And as you can see, for the most, for, for now, they all map to specific trace flags. Now, that is, that was the first wave, if you will. Um, we can, at any time, introduce new hints, um, documented or not, but documented, that may not have a trace flag counterpart. So in all essence, what I mean is, if you need for any reason to hint to the optimizer for some behavior, do use use hints instead of trace flags for that purpose. Uh, you also see three here that have a database option counterpart, for example. So as much as possible, we're moving on the, in the direction of if you need to add some kind of knob, do it in a way that is at least uh, clear enough when you are looking at the code. I don't have to uh, keep in mind that 4138 means disabling the optimizer row goal. I will see that in plain English when I'm looking at a query design. Uh, and this is the short URL you can use for reference, which has all our trace flags uh, documented there. Okay, so let me run a, a oh, again, actually, so 4.13, I have 15 minutes, right? 15 minutes, yeah. I'll just run yeah, one okay. demo at the end, but I'll keep this one for now. Uh, uh, again, allowing you guys to run the script later. So create or alter is something else we've introduced in SP1. Um, this is not really a, it's not anything but a time saver for developers, if you will. Uh, writing, uh, if exists, specific table or store procedure or function, and then drop, and then if not exists, now I, I can create, it's just too cumbersome to write. So, um, to increase developer productivity, but anyone that writes code is now able to use create or alter to very quickly uh, just uh, write their store procedures or function or triggers or UDFs or views and, um, and be able to, with a single uh, uh, expression, create or alter, take care of the fact that the, the, the object may exist or not, and if it does, I would need to drop or alter, whatever. Now, Keep in mind that um, it's available only for those specific types of objects, so uh, store procedures, triggers, and whatnot, because those are the kinds of objects that if you go and look at the uh, T-SQL that creates or, or alters those, nothing really changes but the create or alter key keyword. Now, that's not the same for tables or even schemas. For example, if I create a table, uh, I can see here on the left side uh, the T-SQL to create my table. But if you need to alter a column, as I can see, it's very much different, okay? So I, will, I still need to have separate create and alter uh, commands for uh, these two types of objects. Okay. okay, and this is something that's actually very exciting for, for, for me and for us here and for a lot of customers that have started to use this, is um, the ability to track query progress. Uh, and this is obviously showing something that it shouldn't. Uh, the the um, uh, animation is all is all is bad, but let me let me go straight to the point. So um, the ability to, if you're running into a query performance issue, uh, or you think it's even a query performance issue, the ability to do in-flight um, troubleshooting is very important. The ability to be able to connect to any server and understand, uh, looking at the specific session what that session is doing, and even looking at the plan as the plan progresses in its execution is important to detect and to try to troubleshoot, namely scenarios where you have long-running queries. So uh, this, this can already be enabled 
actually send SQL Server 2014 uh, if you do these three uh, operations here. Either if you are using SSMS, you point to 2014 and 2016 and click on the Include Live Query Statistics button, you are enabling this ability of the engine. Or uh, in line with your query, if you run with Set Statistics XML or Profile, you're also turning that on. But the point is, uh, all, all this, what it does, it turns on something we call the uh, profiler uh, infrastructure, and this has a very high overhead. As we've measured in TPCC-like workloads, the overhead can be actually over 75%. So that's why probably you don't have this running all the time in your, in your uh, server. Um, you could actually, if you run the next event session with this event, which again, I would not advise you to do in production uh, all the time, uh, but it, what this does is that this enables that profiling infrastructure in the, in the background, and then you would able to actually be able to look, at, well, while this was running, you would be able to tap into any running session, not only the one you're running on, which would be this case here, and look at the live plan as it is progressing. But again, very high overhead, probably why you're not running it all the time, and, uh, and that's, that's a good decision. So what we've done is to introduce something we call the lightweight version of this uh, ability, a lightweight tracking, if you will. Um, we, this dramatically reduces that performance overhead and now allows for you to continuously run this infrastructure. Because if you continuously run this, this uh, ability in the SQL Server engine, this will allow you at any point in time to do live query troubleshooting. Um, this can be enabled by, uh, by this global trace flag 7412. I would, uh, unless your server is already CPU bound, like you're running all the time with 95% CPU, uh, unless you are at that point, uh, turn on this trace flag at any server you have. This would be my, my advice here. Um, because this enables that lightweight profiling infrastructure there, and then you'll see in a few minutes what it unleashes here. So um, one thing that happens when I enable the lightweight profiling is that the, um, the CZM exec query profiles DMV, which is something that actually uh, f uh, populates the live query stats uh, uh, ability of, or, or feature of SSMS, now also uh, is also populated with this uh, lightweight profiling, which means that for all essence, we are now able to run uh, live query stats on all sessions at any given point in time. And this is extremely useful for, ex let's say, a production DBA that someone calls and says, hey, you have a problem, to tap into a running system and look at what it's doing. We've also, by the way, enabled this new DMF, CZM Exec Query Statistics XML, and it requires the session ID. And when you do that, you will get a snapshot of the actual execution plan with actual runtime metrics as it is uh, right now running uh, in SQL Server. So this is, already, this is also extremely useful not to actually see the query progress, but to take snapshots of it if that's something you, you would want to do. Uh, okay, <coughs> so some numbers here, because numbers are important before I go into the quick demo over this. Um, with the same TPCC-like workload, the regular profiling infrastructure, as you see here, has uh, at least 75% uh, uh, overhead. The lightweight profiling, as we introduced in Service Pack 1, has 1.5 to 2% CPU overhead. So that's what I meant by, unless you're already running on servers that are CPU bound, if you can, um, let's say, take this overhead, and the trade-off being the ability to do live troubleshooting at any point in time, I would advise you to actually turn on Trace Flag 7412 and leave it on uh, on ev any of your servers. Okay, so um, just a, a quick comparison between the regular profiling and the lightweight profiling. Um, while the regular profiling has the full runtime statistics of for any plan that is running, um, we do have one limitation with the lightweight profiling, which is we're not tracking CPU. Now. We're tracking every other bit of information you can see in show plan, but CPU here. Um, if that is uh, paramount for your query analysis, then you can still run that query, 
by clicking on the uh, include live query stats in SMS, which turns on regular profiling. And for that query, you would see CPU usage. But uh, if you're tracking uh, queries that are heavy on IO, for example, uh, or have a lot of weights, whatever it is, uh, you'll be able, you don't really need CPU tracking for that, but you'll be able to use this, this uh, feature to, to, to troubleshoot those live in production. So uh, this one, I'm going to do the demo very quickly. Um, I'll put up my, okay. So I'm already using the latest version of SMS, which is 17.2, but this actually, this is available um, in any version that has, what I'm about to do, any version that has um, live query stats. So uh, I will kick off some uh, workload in the back. And let me use this one. Okay, so I'm kicking off some workload in the back, and I'm the DBA, and I got a call, and the call says, hey, um, as usual, my SQL Server is slow, because as any production DBA knows, uh, the database is proven, is guilty until proven <laughs> otherwise, right? So it's up to the DBA to actually prove that it is either a database problem or not. So what can I do? Um, one of the things I can do which is, I have this, I'm already giving a sneak peek, but um, I'll be talking about this in a, in a couple of minutes, is I can, if I'm using the latest version of SSMS, I can actually right-click my, um, my server and go to the reports, and I now have this here. So the performance dashboard report, which is something that has, has existed for some time now, in 17.2, we've made it a native embedded report into SSMS, which also means that for anyone that has used performance dashboard before, that you needed to deploy a schema into into a master, and then you would run these reports from uh, maybe your laptop against whatever servers that you have pre-deployed that schema, no more. So everything is self-contained here. So I can click, and I can go and check um, what what uh, what is uh, happening in my server in terms of performance? I can see that I have parallelism weights. I can see that yeah, hang on. Uh, actually, I do have a lot of CPU usage now. In this case, most of it is not SQL. Um, let me actually uh, do a disclaimer here. I'm running the same uh, client application that's generating the workload in the same server. That's probably mm -hmm. not the best scenario. That's why I'm seeing a lot of CPU not being SQL. But if you're running in a server that, does, that runs other services, for example, SSAS, uh, besides the SQL Server engine, uh, you can use this kind of, you can use this performance dashboard to understand if I'm looking at a CPU problem inside my SQL Server or anything else running in this, in this uh, box. I could perhaps go here to the user requests and uh, see what else, what, what is running here. And maybe I would be able to find some query that uh, may not be running so well. Um, session ID 58, for example. But maybe I'm, I like other kinds of flavor. I can right click here and uh, use activity monitor, for example. And activity monitor, let, let me go here to the recent extensive, que or actually the active extensive queries. And, I have a few active expensive queries here. I actually have this one that's been running for 69 seconds now. And uh, the, well, that's the CPU time actually. The elapsed time is over um, two and a half minutes. So uh, I'm a production DBA. I have set 74, the trace flag 7412 uh, uh, on by default as a start of trace flag. So that means I can look at any query execution. I can right click on this and show live execution plan. And when I'm looking at this, I'm able to actually see, well, not the right one, sorry, it's not 56. Yeah, this one. I'm able to see the plan as it is progressing. So I can uh, go through the plan and I can see, oh, I'm building this lazy uh, spool here. Uh, I'm building this table spool here, so it's, and this one. So quite big, you can see uh, how many rows out of the how many rows I've estimated I'm, I'm, uh, are coming through. So this is actually quite a nice plan to look at. Um, I have something like 43 quintillion rows estimated here. So um, yeah, seems I really have a query performance issue here. Now, I was able to quickly do this in production rather than collecting a trace 
or collecting PSS Diag or collecting X events and then taking them onto my test server or my laptop and then cracking open those traces and trying to see this. No, I'm looking at it as it progresses directly in production with nothing more than 1.5 or 2% overhead by being able to do this. So very manageable for the most part. Uh, what I can also do is, let me see the query that's running here. Well, I can't see everything. Maybe I can right click here, see properties, um, go to my statement, uh, copy, I don't like this, hang on. Um, I have something better. In case anyone noticed, we do, we, for a few versions, we now have this little button here, which allows me to, at, with any plan that I've, I've opened, I click on it, and I can actually see the well-formed T-SQL here. So very, uh, very easy and very, um, very, uh, very cool to just be able to do this. So, really, SMS is not responding now. <laughs> okay, done. So, um, yeah, it is in the it's in the wrong database. I know. Let me put it in the right one. Uh, I'm looking at my query here. I already know my plan because I've looked at it in the in the live query stats. Um, I'm looking at this and I see. Oh, hang on. So remember when we see in the, in the, saw in the slide uh, uh, some half hour ago. Uh, I had a query running with 9481. This actually means that it's forcing the legacy CE. Uh, yeah, probably this went to some query tuning and uh, someone found that the old CE or the legacy CE had a better uh, performance than the new CE that we've introduced in 2014 and above. I'm not so sure at this point, given what I was seeing there um, in the live query stats. So I will just actually um, uh, comment this out. And let me execute it. This is a simple select, so I'll just execute this in production. Um, and let's see what comes out of it. Well, first of all, it's executed in less than one second, or in about one second. And I can see that the plan is very much different from the one I was running, or I'm still running, actually, uh, in live query stats. Uh, first, for example, uh, if I look at the, oh, come on, just help me a bit. If I look at the estimated number of rows here, you can see those 45 quintillion rows. Uh, with a new C, for example, I'm estimating 500 rows. So, and the plan did execute in, in about a second, right? So, it kind of seems that I've fixed, as a DBA, I was able to uh, see the, the problem, and in this simple case, was able to hypothesize what's, what was going on. And um, in this case, I actually have a fix, and I will send to my devs to be able to uh, push this up to production so that they don't use the old CE here anymore. So very, very powerful to be able to use the ability of doing live query troubleshooting. All of this is available because that underlying uh, profiling infrastructure that unleashes all this is now very lightweight. And if you enable it all the time, this is uh, super important for production DBAs. So let me uh, stop my workload here. And I'll go back to my um, to my slides. Any questions here? I'm actually only, not only one. There's a one person asked. Chitan asks, does trace flag 834 large pages apply for SQL Server 2016 SP1 to still? It does. Okay. Yes. That's it. Lots okay. of people are excited about what you've been showing on stuff, though. Well, I'm glad. I'm 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 hoping that you start using it and feel free to. Uh, flood us with feedback. Good, bad, and the ugly. We want to hear about everything. Um, so, still some some uh, things we've added in in, in uh, v16 of SSMS. Uh, support for multi-statement show plan comparison. If you've used show plan comparison, uh, it's the ability to pick up two plans and be able to drive insights from from those by comparing them. Uh, if we have a couple minutes, which we actually sure. don't. Uh, I would I would do this. Okay, I'll still do this if we have time. Um, this is actually uh, in um, in Query Store, the UI part of Query Store. We're now we have introduced uh, in the last version of V16, so it's it's three or four months old already. Four months old already. Uh, we've introduced the ability to filter out by the number of different plans. For example, let's say you will crack open a, a report in Query Store, and you only want to see those queries that have more than two plans uh, stored in Query Store. Uh, you can do that very easily by applying these filters, which are available in all, in all Query Store reports. In V17, we've added these new reports here. 
for example, one of the things about query store is that from there you can force plans, right? Um, if you found a plan regression, you can force the better plan to be persistent for all uh, subsequent executions. But let's say some you change, you move your database to uh, SQL Server 2017, for example, um, or you applied some um, CU that has a fix for something that uh, may be impacting your, your query plan uh, shape, and now you want to really remove that that force plan. You want to let the optimizer do its work again and maybe to come up with a better plan going forward. Um, you didn't really have a very uh, explicit way of doing that in the UI with SSMS. You would do it with uh, in a script. So we added this report, queries with force plans, where you can clearly see which queries you have that you have previously forced a plan. And this, there's also this uh, new feature of SMS that I'm going to show, which is the query analysis scenario. Uh, and we've introduced one, one uh, key feature there, which is the ability to troubleshoot C cardinality estimation differences. Um, and I'm going to demo that in, in a minute. I'm all in the last few slides of my presentation. So what's next for relational engine? Meaning what's there in SQL 2017 and, uh, uh, and, and beyond that? And maybe even in market for post uh, um, or with the upcoming SQL Server 2016 SP2. So for example, something we have in 2017 is the ability to uh, now also in show plan have information about which statistics were used by the optimizer for a given plan when it was compiling that plan. So <clears throat> I'm able to now store that information in show plan, again, uh, iterating through the notion of show plan being as much as possible the one-stop shop for everything related to query execution. If someone sends me an actual execution plan, I'll be able to understand what is going on, what is what trace flags are active, what statistics were loaded. I'm able to understand the full spectrum that uh, of the ecosystem that impacted this, uh, this execution here. So, for example, in, in this plan that I've collected, I was looking at a, a, a large misestimation from um, uh, 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 an operation running over this in, uh, index, which obviously has the, a statistic with the same name. And I was able to see that, okay, I'm using a full scan, so 100% sampling. Why do I see such um, skews in the, <clears throat> in the estimation versus the actual rows? And with that, I was able to also see that I have, I'm sorry, a modification counter of 19,000, which in this case is actually more than the row count I had in the table. So at any given point in time, I probably turned off auto stats, um, and somehow this was not getting updated. So what I did was a direct insight I got from looking at the plan is I need to update these stats, which I did. And running the plan again, I actually got a slightly better uh, estimations versus actuals. And I could also see that, yeah, pretty much my these stats were updated. I can even see when it, they were last updated, as you can see here. So since I was working at 3 a.m. Um, OK, so um, this is, uh, I, I also have scripts for this demo. I will, again, leave them on, on, um, on my, our GitHub. Go grab SQL Server 2017, let's say on Docker, which is something you can easily run on your own laptop, and 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 get a feel of what's there in SQL 2017, even at this point of uh, in stuff we've added in show plan, because you'll be pleasantly surprised. Other enhancements on 2017, obviously we have automatic query plan tuning. Uh, this is uh, the ability that uh, if you're running a query store on a given database, if we detect regressions, we can automatically address those and force the plan that seems to be the best one. And then we'll observe performance there. And it, if it turns out this was not a good decision, we'll just roll back what we did. Uh, we also have adaptive uh, query processing. Um, this would be like uh, at least a whole hour of, of discussion, so I'm obviously skipping that here. Um, but if you're going at pass, for example, uh, I, I will be having a session with Joe Sack there that will uh, dive deeper into this into to these topics. Um, in a SQL 2012 SP4, which was um, which uh, in which we are adding a number of uh, enhancements that we've added to higher versions, like uh, uh, Service Pack 2 for 2014, we are bringing back 
to the last known service pack for SQL 2012. So a lot of those enhanced extended diagnostics in Showplan XML will be available in 2012. Uh, memory grant uh, warnings, the diagnostics will also be available there. So you have a better story in terms of Showplan diagnostics across several versions. And why we do have some more exciting improvements coming for uh, an upcoming SQL Server 2016 SV2. Um, and those again will be a whole new session. So I'm keeping those in my pocket for um, <laughs> to, to speak at another occasion. Uh, but but tune in tune in for that. Um, this is just a, a number of bookmarks I want to leave you with. And uh, Brent, you'll be the judge if I have three more minutes to do. A quick demo on the query plan comparison or not Otherwise, yeah sure one more demo and then we'll bail yeah okay go That's for good. it so um let me bring up again my ssms okay let me close this i don't need this anymore okay so what i what i've uh, it's still picking up on the same scenario that we have here um let me do this Sorry, let me just grab my plan here. And this. Ah, here. So. Come on. Ah, done. So, uh, um, I have here a slow plan that I've captured. Uh, so it was the actual execution plan. Um, I, I had um, run the, the, I've collected the actual execution plan and saved it. Um, or I could be using the, I could have just run this, this uh, query here. Uh, let me see actually how much time it took. Uh, yeah, it still takes, uh, well, it takes 30 seconds, not long. So I've captured this that took 30 seconds to run, which I consider slow for my workload, okay? Uh, and I've gone through some, um, through some uh, exercise where I was actually able to uh, do some changes to the query. Now, I went uh, and this query became faster, but I want to compare them both. I want to understand what can be uh, happening there. So I can compare show plan uh, I can use this that option. So let me run that again. I right click on any open region of the plan and I have this compare show plan. I actually also have this new uh, feature here, which is the analyze actual execution plan. Let's see if this gives me anything. Okay. It actually does. It's telling me that, so I've opened this plan which I previously saved. Let me close this. I've, uh, I've started the single plan analysis, which for now only has the let me try to bump this up, only has the inaccurate cardinality estimation scenario. And I'm able to see that I have 14,000% difference in this clustered index scan, uh, which is this one. And uh, going down the tree, I can see that, for example, in this clustered index seek here, uh, I also have 12,000% difference between the actual rows and the estimated rows. So this is what the information is telling me. Now, as I click on each one of these, and let's, let me stay on this one for now, I'm able to see some details of my findings. First thing I'm seeing is that, okay, the predicate for this operator depends on a parameter, start order date, and the compile time value was an, either unknown or different from the runtime value. So that's probably why you have a skew between estimations and actually runtime values. Uh, another option or another possibility would be uh, so this is not absolutely, um, this will give you, uh, the user, some uh, actionables that they can go and try to do or to change or to observe or to uh, analyze um, in a given plan. So if, if you will give you hints on, on what needs to be looked at. Uh, this is especially useful for uh, folks that maybe have a bit less experience looking at um, the query performance and from this feature in SSMS, which by the way is offline. So I'm, I opened an offline SQL plan file, which can, could even be from SQL 2014 or something. Um, and I was able to 
all sequel to 2012. And I was able to run this and SSMS itself offline gave me some insights on what to look at. Okay, so it's telling me I have uh, a difference between compiled values and runtime values for this parameter. Okay, let me zoom out and go look at that because I do have information about the parameters in the root node. So I select the root node. Let me look at properties of that root node. And uh, one thing I can look at is the uh, parameter list. So I do have start order date, right? And I can see that the compiled value was this date, but the runtime value is this one, okay? What I have here is a, obviously then a classic case of this uh, parameter was sniffed at compile time, the query was optimized for this incoming parameter, but then apparently the data distribution is so different between buckets, between dates, if you will, um, that using another parameter yields, uh, obviously the plan was cached, so then I'm using the same, but yields what is perceived as um, not so good performance for this same query. Um, so I did, however, uh, apply a few, um, a few workarounds uh, that are possible, uh, and I did come up with a better plan. So what does that better plan have? Let me compare. So I'll I'm going to close this, right-click. I will compare show plan with the one that I got after I applied some, um, some optimization, like, for example, um, uh, using some optimized for a known hint or recompiling all the time, something that made the plan faster, if you will, for that other uh that uh, that other um oops that other uh, incoming parameter so um, this plan was faster as i can see here uh in the in the slow plan the actual number of rows out of this class index scan is 400,000 and it was estimated 2800 and for the good plan for the same 2800 it was estimating 2000 uh, it actually uh, got 2000 rows and why is that well, this is actually uh, uh, the plan that I got. Uh, so I'm looking at the bottom plan here is a good one. So bottom plan here, um, I'm looking at the parameters there. And yeah, so the compiled value is the same as the runtime value. So I'm actually able to see that for the uh, compiled value, I actually have a good, very good plan. But for other data distributions, I don't. So now I would, uh, I would apply a number of known uh, techniques to fix this. I could, uh, and this is the demo, by the way, you can run it on your own and then do some, some work here. I could use option recompile. I could optimize for unknown or optimize for, for the start order date that my users use the most. And that, that way I would optimize for the majority of my users using that query and some other users, users that use a different um, uh, order date they would perhaps have worse performance. Or I could uh, alter the procedure to have a local variable. I could use this hint, which is one of the new use hints, which is to disable parameter sniffing. So I had a number of other options I could use to fix this scenario. And these were e more easily unleashed by the ability to use these features in SSMS, which again, I started by the looking at the single plan, uh, looking at the analyzing the actual plan, but also then comparing to the other one that led me to, uh, to understand exactly what, what, what the, the optimization was or what the optimal plan was versus why did this one go so go south. Okay, and that kind of concludes my, uh, my session for today. Again, thank you very much for sticking around. Thank uh, I always you. have a time with, with this. This is a problem yeah. with my time management, but thank Man, you. Man, no, I, you've got so many cool things you get to talk about. Jeez, it's been, uh, SQL Server Team's been on fire lately, so nice job, sir.